to Eckstein Hall, Marquette University Law School. I'm Mike Goucher, and this is On the Issues. This is our continuing series of conversations with news and policymakers, people who are doing interesting, important work in this region and beyond. Today, we are joined by Professor Matt Desmond. He is an urban sociologist at Harvard University, and he is the author of this new book. It's called Evicted. It is just out today, Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. This book, uh, the story that Matt Desmond tells, is set here in Milwaukee, although it's a story that you could find in many cities around this country. And the reviews of this book so far have been incredibly strong. You may have seen the New York Times on Sunday. Uh, the reviewer, Barbara Ehrenreich, some of you are familiar with her, described this book as astonishing. Won't you please welcome Professor Matt Desmond to Marquette University Law School. So how did Evicted come to be? How did you end up in Milwaukee, and how did you end up writing a book about yeah, what you found in Milwaukee? Yeah, yeah. First of all, I just want to say thank you, everyone, for coming. It's a truly an honor to be here, especially given the weather. So thank you so much for coming out today. But this you're not the, surprised that they're here. You, you've no, dealt with no, the no. I, I, you know, I thought, you know, I looked outside. I was like, they'll still be here. You know, this is Milwaukee. You know, <laughs> this is, you know, there'd have to be some serious right. event to shut the city down. So. Um, so yeah, so I started this book because I wanted to try to write a different kind of book about poverty in America today. You know, we had a lot of books about certain poor neighborhoods, and we kind of took that as like the focus of our books. And we had a lot of books about certain low income populations, like single moms or folks involved with gangs. But I always thought that those books, uh, they taught me a lot, but they were missing something. And that was the fact that poverty isn't just an isolated event, it's a relationship. It involves rich folks and poor folks alike. And so I wanted something to capture that, some way to study that relationship. And I thought, Evicted does that. You can look at landlords, you can look at tenants, you can look at judges, and kind of everyone embroiled in this process. And that's what brought me to the subject matter. So this idea began as a dissertation, was it not? That's right. You were yeah. a UW-Madison uh, That's right. student. Uh, yeah, yeah, don't judge me for that, Milwaukee. <laughs> but I, I did live in Madison for a little bit. Um, so yeah. you, you, you found that uh, in your work, uh, I'll call you Matt instead of Professor Desmond, even though yeah. I don't want to disrespect great. you. Um, but, but you found that, that when we talked about poverty, we didn't spend a lot of time talking about the role of affordable housing right. or the role of eviction yeah, in creating right. poverty. That's right. That was a big eye-opening thing that I found in the study. And we had talked a lot about jobs and joblessness, mass incarceration, welfare reform. But housing was kind of absent from one of our main ideas of what's causing poverty in America today. And there's a reason for that. We've either focused a lot of time on public housing and looking at kind of the projects, or we kind of looked through housing because we cared about neighborhoods. We cared about the resistance to gentrification, for example, their level of segregation. But here was a private rental market consuming so much of the incomes of low-income families, dictating where they lived, who they lived with, um, exacerbating their poverty, causing instability, and we didn't know a lot about it. And so, yeah, that was a big thing I discovered uh, when I started this process. And now, you know, having kind of completed this project, I'm convinced that we can't fix poverty in this country if we don't address housing. You, you may, uh, there was struck by a line that you had towards the end of this book, and it said something, and I hope I'm quoting you accurately, without stable shelter, everything falls apart. Yeah, that's right. And I think that, like, but I think we recognize that in our own lives, right? I mean, imagine if we didn't have a home, or imagine if we're spending 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of our income on rent. What would our life be like? Uh, but that's the situation that a lot of low-income families are facing today. So we've reached a point in America where the majority of poor renting families are spending at least 50% of their income on housing costs, and one in four is spending over 70% on rent and utilities. And so under those conditions, um, things like having a stable grasp on your community, being able to let your kids stay in school and finish school there, being able to afford basic necessities um, become wishes and dreams, yeah. Um, this book uh, contains incredibly powerful human stories of the people that Matt met during his time in Milwaukee. But before we tell some of those stories, um, I wanted to spend just a couple of minutes on numbers again. Yeah. And you touched on a few numbers right there. But let's talk specifically about the problem of eviction mm -hmm. in a place like Milwaukee. How common 
his eviction here. Right, so the first thing I did to address that, for, first of all, when I started my field work, I thought we already knew that. You know, I thought we'd have some good solid numbers on how many folks are evicted, where evictions happen. And I went looking for studies that reported this and found nothing, found nothing. And eviction had been overlooked by journalists and policymakers and social scientists kind of studying poverty. So I set out to kind of collect that data myself. And so one thing I did was analyze hundreds of thousands of eviction records in the city of Milwaukee. These are court-ordered evictions that go, uh, go uh, through court right, right across the street. And what I found was that every year in Milwaukee, about one in 30 renter-occupied households are evicted annually. And if you look just in the inner city, just in predominantly African-American north side of the city, it's about one in 14 renter-occupied households in the city are, are evicted every year through the courts. It's an astonishing number. When I crunched those numbers originally, I thought we got something wrong. And I was like, okay, team, let's do it again. There was a mistake. But I think that you also have to understand that those are just evictions that go through the court. And a lot of the landlords that I was spending time with uh, had these other ways of moving families out, what they called informal evictions. So one landlord that I met told me, Matt, for every eviction that I do that goes to the court, there are at least 10 that don't. And his name was Joe, and Joe just had a way of paying tenants, saying like, look, Mike, you're behind a rent. We both know you're not gonna get caught up. Mm -hmm. I'll give you 200 bucks, let you use my van if you move by Sunday. That's an eviction, that's an involuntary move. We don't see that in court records. I met a landlord that'll just take your door off. So, uh, so there's a lot of ways that landlords can uh, displace families. And so we did a survey of about 1,000 families in Milwaukee, renting families in Milwaukee, and we try to capture all those moves. Formal evictions that go through the court, informal evictions that don't, landlord foreclosures, and building condemnations, when the city kind of closes your house as being unfit for human habitation. When you add up all those moves, you learn that about one in eight of all renters in the city, this city, experience some kind of involuntary move every two years. One in eight. One in eight. And even worse for, for example, African-American women. That's right, that's right. And so if anyone spent time in eviction court, you can see that the face of America's eviction epidemic is moms with kids. It's moms with kids. And it's especially moms with kids from low-income African-American neighborhoods and low-income Latino neighborhoods. So in Milwaukee, uh, African-American women renters, about one in five of them report being evicted sometime in their life. And for white women renters, it's about one in 15. So this is why I was kind of came to this realization by looking at the numbers, but also just by spending time in court and kind of getting a sense of uh, evictions on the ground, that if incarceration has become this typical, extremely consequential experience for, for African-American men from low-income communities, eviction has become uh, the equivalent for African-American women from those communities. Give people in this room and on, on television a, a sense of how many evictions we're talking about in a year, for example, in Milwaukee. Uh, Milwaukee does about 16,000 evictions uh, every year, formally. So that, that amounts to about 40 people a day in the city of Milwaukee evicted, including a day like today. Including a day like today that's cold, that's snowing, that's windy. The trucks are out today. There are businesses who do really nothing but help with evictions, are there not? There are, there are moving companies. There are companies that collect eviction records and sell those to landlords so you can keep track of evictions. Uh, there are sheriff deputies whose full-time job basically is to execute eviction and foreclosure orders. Um, court commissioners often have to hold court in offices that aren't offices. They're kind of storage units or settle things in the hallway. So eviction has kind of stretched the capacity of our courts. And it's also, it's also given rise to, uh, given rise to uh, yeah, companies that come, al come along to triage uh, uh, this mess. It, you touched on the, the role of uh, affordable housing or the lack of affordable housing in, yeah. in this problem. And I want to transition into your personal experience here, and this is what the book is about. Uh, you came to Milwaukee in 2008, and so people are looking for affordable housing. Yeah. One of the places they found it was at a trailer park on Milwaukee's south side, College yeah. Avenue. That's right. Um, tell us about that place. You lived there for a while. Right. Tell us about that place. So I moved to Milwaukee and then I was like, okay, how do I meet families experiencing eviction? Where do I go? And um, so I opened the paper one day and the Sentinel had a story of a trailer park that was facing, um, uh, was facing a dispute with the city. And the city was threatening to close the trailer park yep. down because it had so many code violations and police calls. So like any good ethnographer, I, I 
went down and rented a trailer in that trailer park because I thought, well, maybe we'll see, well, this will be a site of mass evictions. That didn't happen, but it was a place to see kind of normal everyday evictions going on. So it's a 131 trailers on a skinny strip of asphalt. Uh, most of those trailers are quite old, built in like the 1970s. Um, most folks there uh, uh, were working kind of in diners or nursing aides. Uh, there are folks on welfare there and disability. Most folks there were very hard up, but they were holding on to that trailer park. They were very nervous that um, that if you know if the city did close it down, uh, they didn't know where they would go. I was struck by something you said. You, you lived there for a period of months, and you said your trailer, I guess, was one of the the nicer ones. But it still had no hot water it didn't have for the time water. you were there, yeah. even though the landlord knew that you were writing a book about this experience. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my card was taped, you know, uh, bullet pointed to the office bulletin board there, and. Uh, the, from the first day, I was like, I'm a writer. I'm going to write about you and this trailer park. And uh, for most of the time, I lived in, in the trailer. Just in, I didn't have hot water because the pipe connecting, you know, the, the hot water heater to the ventilation pipe was off. So if I turned the hot water on, it would be bad news for me. And, um, and so imagine, like, if that's what I had to deal with, imagine what tenants who are, uh, who are living in that trailer park uh, have to deal with with respect to housing problems. How did you get people to talk? about their experience with eviction and get them to open up, open up about what they were seeing in their own lives. Yeah, everyone was different, you know, everyone was different. And I think that just being open and honest about what I wanted to do, uh, uh, people responded to that. The first person I met in the book is a woman named Lorraine. And I was in the trailer park's uh, office uh, with the building manager, which I would kind of, I started out there to kind of see how tenants and the building manager negotiated. And Lorraine came in, and she's, uh, she was a grandmother at the time that I met her. She was in her mid-50s, and she was kind of wringing something in her hands, and it turned out to be a 24-hour sheriff's eviction notice, this kind of bright neon yellow paper that they, uh, that they send tenants when things are, time is up. And uh, she asked for more time. She kind of was trying to negotiate with the uh, building inspector, and, or excuse me, the uh, property manager, and then she went back to her trailer, and I, just followed her there and I knocked on her door and she opened the door and she was weeping and uh, she was just overcome with stress and I I told her what I was interested in doing and said I was interested in a book of trying to understand eviction from your point of view and so she just let me in and that was our first conversation. Uh, some of these stories are uh, really uh, stories of hopes and dreams deferred or um a run of bad luck uh, that led to something else. Uh, you profile a uh, a man in this book named Scott. Yeah. And Scott was battling drug addiction yeah. issues. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about his story. Yeah. I, I do think it's important to recognize that Scott's story is anomalous in the book. You know, most folks in the book didn't do drugs. Most folks in the book didn't drink alcohol, which, uh, which was disappointing to me because I, you know, <laughs> I like to have a drink after a hard day. And, um, and they weren't having it. And, um, uh, but Scott did. Scott wrestled with an uh, opiate addiction, and he uh, used to be a nurse and uh, hurt his back, well, got prescribed painkillers um, during a time when prescriptions for opiate painkillers were going up and up. He got hooked, and eventually uh, that landed him uh, uh, losing his, his job, losing his middle-class home, and landing uh, in a homeless shelter where he met someone, and then they moved into the trailer park. And so we see Scott... Uh, wrestling with that addiction. And Scott himself would tell you that um, it, was a, it was a failing on his part. You know, it was a weakness on his part. But he would also tell you that he thought there was some medical basis for this. There's some biological basis for this. And um, one thing that was striking to me was, you know, we see Scott kind of hit rock bottom on this book and then try to climb out, try to do something about his addiction and seek help. And one thing you do when you're at that point, you try to get help from the free county clinic. And this is what that's like, okay? You gotta wake up at dark. And you go, uh, you drive to the county clinic and you go up and you hope that you're the first one. But you often aren't. You know, and the elevator doors open and there's a line of people that are wrestling with addiction sitting there, uh, you know, an hour, two hours before the doors open. And there's a scene in the, Scott, in the book where Scott confronts that sits down for a few minutes and then kind of goes up and leaves. And he could, have, he could have waited it out, he could have gone the next day and the next day and he would admit to that, but I think there's something wrong in this country where we don't have enough 
aid and we haven't dedicated enough help to people that are struggling with addiction they're act actively reaching and trying to help you know when they they line up in that line and are turned away day after day after day in a city like milwaukee scott eventually did climb out of addiction in this book and part of that reason the reason he did was because he found stable housing he was able to kind of find a small apartment through a program called the guest house and land and stable housing and kind of uh, that was a very sturdy foothold for him to kind of finally beat this monster. How did people who are living in the park, uh, uh, the trailer park, feel about their landlord, uh, yeah. the man you describe as Tobin yeah. in the book? What was the relationship yeah. between landlord and tenant? Mixed, mixed. You know, so some people called Tobin greedy and, um, and a jerk, you know, and some people called him a good man and an honest man. And um, one thing that I really cared about going into this project is, why would someone own a trailer park? Why would someone own property on 22nd and Atkinson? Like, what's going on? And uh, one of the things I wanted to know is, how much money are they making? How much money are they making? And, um, and so I looked at Tobin's uh, rent rolls, calculated his mortgage payments, uh, property taxes, water bills, paid attention to missed payments. If you add all that up, you come to this figure that uh, the owner of a, one of the worst trailer parks in, at the time, the fourth poorest city in the country, uh, was making over $400,000 uh, every year after expenses. So what does that mean? That it's means- from Illinois, right? Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> That's an important point for this room, I recognize that. He was doing time in Illinois, as you say, yeah. Um, that's right. 400000 Over $400,000 a year. And so that means he's making 35 times what his tenants working full-time for minimum wage were making. The tenants had that idea in their head. They kind of knew that there was a vast amount that separated uh, their poverty from his security. But they were focused on that. They were focused on much more smaller, tangible issues. Can you make sure my bathtub doesn't th sink through my floorboard? I hurt my back at work. Can you let me slide for a few months? Um, my daughter needs some medical expenses. Can you get me through that? And sometimes he did, and sometimes he didn't. That's, that's really where their focus was. After you uh, stayed at the, uh, the trailer park on the south side, you moved to the north side, to a yeah. rooming house at uh, First and Locust. First and Locust, believe. yeah. And uh, you met another uh, group of individuals, and, and I'd like to talk about some of them because it's, it's about eviction in a different part of town. And uh, Arlene yeah. uh, is a woman who's trying to care for two sons and trying to find housing. Yeah. And tell us about um, her experience and the time that you spent with her. It's, it's sort of a heartbreaking story in many respects. Yeah, it is. Um, so Arlene, uh, when I met her, she was a single mom. She had two boys, uh, Jorah and Jafaris. And, um, and she was renting a two-bedroom apartment on 13th and Keefe. And uh, that uh, went for $550 a month and took 88% of her income, took 88% of her income. And, um, you know, we might ask, why did she move somewhere that takes 88% of her income? And the answer is, there's really nowhere else for her to go. That's really the bottom of the market in Milwaukee at that time. She couldn't rent a smaller place because she had children, so landlords weren't going to rent her a one-bedroom or a studio apartment unless she concealed a child from them. That, that is a big issue. I, I don't want to issue, interrupt, yeah. but that is a big issue, yeah. trying to rent if you have kids. It's huge, and we could talk a lot about that. It's huge. and so. Um, one thing that's big is a lot, a lot of landlords don't want kids in their, their places. And we know from audit studies that families with children face discrimination um, in, in non-trivial non amounts. We know from s surveys of landlords that a lot of landlords don't recognize that even as discrimination, as they'll know that, okay, I, gender discrimination and racial discrimination, we recognize that is illegal, but you can still have adult-only properties. It's actually against the law, but a lot of folks that are operating uh, in the city uh, don't recognize that. So Arlene, so that, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah, yeah. yeah. So when I met Arlene, uh, she was under this circumstance, and just a circumstance that I think that any of us um, would be crushed by, and I think that's an important thing to recognize, that for someone like Arlene, it's paying 80% of her income to rent. It doesn't take a major shock to lead to an eviction. It doesn't take a huge family emergency, a car accident, a robbery. 
it can take something very small because your grasp on housing is so tenuous. And so for Arlene, what started it was a, a funeral, it was death. And her sister died. It wasn't her sister in the biological sense, but in the spiritual sense, a very close friend. And uh, she decided to put in some money for the funeral. Uh, she didn't have the money, but she made that decision. She thought she, it, would, it was the right thing to do. She would have been ashamed if she didn't do it. And uh, the landlord let her slide that month. But the next month, she missed an appointment with her caseworker. Arlene received uh, welfare at the time. And she missed an appointment with a caseworker because a letter uh, announcing the appointment was mailed to an address that she had been previously evicted from. And the caseworker typed something into the computer and her check was sanctioned, which means it was, it was reduced. And, uh, and so she was two months behind and she got the, the pink papers and started this process of, of trying to find housing and moving from homeless shelter, um, friends' couches, um, and trying to look for housing. And one thing that I found by just spending a lot of time with Arlene is just how exhausting and draining it is to find housing after you've been evicted. Especially how, how many places did she look at, so inquire about? After this point, um, she looked at 20, and then 40, and then 60, and then 80. Like, I counted. I recorded all this. And she had been refused by all of them. And part of the reason, not only was her poverty, and was not only was her boys, but was also her eviction record. Mm -hmm. So uh, evictions are, uh, come with a, a court record, just like uh, any other uh, court record. They follow you around, and they could have consequences. And a lot of landlords view an eviction as kind of a, it's a deal breaker. And so many landlords refuse to rent to tenants with evictions within the last two or three years. Public housing authorities also count evictions as a strike against your application. So that means that if Arlene wanted to apply for public housing, she not only would have to wait several years until the list unfroze, and then several more years until her application made it up, but then once it made it up, she'd have to just pray that the person reviewing her application would ignore the eviction record that she'd collected while trying to make ends meet as a single mom in the private market on a welfare check. And so that eviction record was following her around and causing a lot of landlords to say no. And that's one of the reasons that people like Arlene move, uh, get evicted from poor neighborhoods and they move into even poorer neighborhoods. They get evicted from high crime neighborhoods and move into higher crime neighborhoods. And this is something that I know not only saw myself on the ground, but also uh, uh, found in statistical work about this as well. I'm trying to remember, but I, I think you said in the book that her, her boys had been in six different schools in one year or something like that. Jory, her oldest, had, had been in five different schools uh, within the year. I mean, and he was f 14 at the time. 14 is hard for any kid, right? 14 is ridiculously hard for a kid who has to face homelessness and that level of residential instability. But the saddest thing, maybe, is that for Jory, it had become normal, you know? And it becomes something that when I asked him, I asked him one time, you know, do, do you care about switching schools? He said, no, I do it all the time. I remember seeing uh, an eviction once uh, from Arlene and her kids, and her youngest came home from school. He was six at the time, Jafaris. And he came home and he walked up, and there was just like this team of movers there, you know, moving everything. Kind of uh, people he hadn't seen before. Uh, Arlene was surprised by this for reasons that I explained in the book. And his reaction was nothing, nothing. He didn't go grab a favorite toy. He didn't cling to his mom. He just turned around and walked back outside to play with other kids. I think it should trouble us deeply that kids in this country, in this rich land, face eviction so much, don't get enough to eat because the rent eats first, and experience this level of instability, not because instability is inherent to poverty, but because their families can't afford to live uh, even in some of our worst neighborhoods. I want to look at the other side of this equation, yeah. and you do this in your book, and I think it's actually one of the strengths of the book that not everybody's wearing a white hat or a black hat in this yeah. book. Uh, people are like they are in real life. They have lots of layers yeah. there to who they are. Um, you spent a, bit, a good bit of time with a couple of uh, landlords, a couple, yeah. who own a number of properties on Milwaukee's north side. Uh, Sharina. Sharina, that was Quentin. Arlene's landlord. Yep. Yeah, yep. Sharina and Quentin. What do they say about why people are evicted? What's the landlord side of this story? Yeah, yeah. I knew that it, if I really wanted to understand the role of housing in creating poverty in this country, I had to get the landlord's perspective. I mean, these are folks that literally own the inner city. 
you know? And so not everyone that's uh, in a poor neighborhood has a boss, a preacher, a social worker, not a member of a gang, but almost all of them have a landlord. You know, these are really important folks for our, um, for our understanding of how cities work and, what, and kind of the texture and everyday lived experience of poverty. And so Sharina owned 36 units. Uh, all of them were on the north side of Milwaukee. Uh, when I met, she had been a landlord for about four years. Before that, she was a public school teacher, top fourth grade in uh, Milwaukee Public Schools. And she saw herself as kind of a charitable businesswoman. She was proud of her business. She felt that um, she had kind of uh, earned it you know, from the ground up, that she had built something. And she kind of found a calling that was, she was good at, which was inner city entrepreneur. So besides being a landlord, she also had a business that transported folks upstate to visit their relatives if they were locked up. She had a credit repair business. She did rent to own. And she was very proud of these ventures. I think she would say that it's very difficult um, owning and operating property in some low-income communities. And she has a lot of, uh, she has war stories. You know, she has a story about a time when a disgruntled mortgage customer uh, threw a firebomb through her office window. She has a story about uh, tenants stuffing socks down the sink and turning the sink on full blast before moving out. Um, and I've, I've seen some of these firsthand. And, and, um, and so it's, I think it's absolutely essential that we complicate this relationship. And I think we let ourselves off the hook if we say, oh, it's the tenants, they're irresponsible, or oh, it's the landlords, they're greedy. It's a lot more complicated than that, and I think the book tries to really bring out uh, that complication. What is the lure of doing business on the north side of Milwaukee? Uh, there are a fair number of people who are struggling. Yeah. Uh, income is a bit more tenuous yeah. uh, in some cases. Why does Sharina, why, why did she see profit on, yeah. on the north side? Yeah, because there is profit there. There is profit there. And this, is a, this was a big realization for me working on this book. I went in, you know, wondering why, you know, people in trailer parks are on, in, in the inner city. And I left thinking, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Because the profit margins are real. And, um, and so, and, there's a, and they're real not despite of these neighborhoods' poverty, but because of it. So what makes homeowning owning like a risky venture in low-income neighborhoods makes landlording uh, potentially lucrative. You can buy property uh, for low. You can have a very low mortgage payment. You can have a low tax payment. Uh, but you can rent it uh, at a decent rate. Now, rents in uh, low-income neighborhoods are lower than they are in more affluent neighborhoods or Watosa, but they're not three, four, five times as much lower. But property values are that much higher in more affluent neighborhoods. So just one example, rent, uh, median asking rent for a two-bedroom apartment in some of the poorest neighborhoods in Milwaukee, neighborhoods with over 40% of folks living in poverty. It was about five, uh, 550 a month uh, in 2010. That was only $50 less than the citywide median, okay? So that means you're able to buy property low, uh, but rent it basically at, at, a, at a decent rate. So the returns are very good. I talked to a landlord whose name a lot of folks is, that followed the Milwaukee Press would know. He owned over 100 uh, properties in the inner city. And he told me, Matt, I started out in Brookfield, Brookfield and I lost money. You know, but I, I went to the inner city and, uh, and I gained money. You know, I made a profit. And he said, you're not in it for the future, meaning appreciation. You're in it for the now. And so I think that Sharina recognized there was an opportunity to make a buck. Uh, in the inner city, and she always told, she told me the first time we met, the hood is good. The hood is good. You know, there's a lot of money to be made there. I want to talk about solutions in a moment, but, but people hear these stories that you're telling, Matt, and, and they're probably interested in how did you gain the trust of individuals? How much time did you end up spending with people? How did that work, and how were you able to record so much information? If you read this book, you will find the the conversations are really specific. How were you able to do that? I think just by, by I mean, living in the communities helped a lot. You know, uh, living in the trailer park helped me meet Lorraine, Scott, who was my neighbor in the trailer park, Pam and Ned, who lived across the street from Scott. So I think living in there helped. And then living on the north side helped me meet folks, folks as well. It's, you know, for people that do this work, you know, investigative journalists or ethnographers, it is often puzzling why people open up in front of you and, and kind of let you into their lives. 
I think just by virtue of spending enough time with people, as much time as I could on the ground, recording not only live, but also with the audio recorder whenever I could, so, uh, so that I'd try to capture these words perfectly and get them on the page perfectly. And just trying to be kind of o open and honest about how I, f how I felt about things. Sometimes this made for really tricky situations. So when I was in with Sharina and Arlene, and Sharina took Arlene to eviction court, uh, who do I sit next to, you know? Uh, who do I drive home? Uh, how does that work? Uh, but those are things that we could get over. Those are things that these kind of awkward bumps in the road that were just part of the process. I think that, I think that people have an integrity for this story. They, want, they wanted me to get it right. They wanted me to understand their full lives. Um, and I hope the book um, does them a little justice, does their generosity and their spunk and their complexity and their humanity uh, some justice. You made an interesting uh, comment to me on the phone the other day. You said, you know, I really love Milwaukee. And you, and you talked about how people actually almost took care of you to, to yeah. some extent, where you're on the north side, yeah. you know, a white boy in a, you know, African-American neighborhood. Yeah. Uh, you said uh, people could not have been more welcoming, could not have been nicer to you. Yeah, sometimes I felt they were too nice, you know, and... Uh, because it, you were white. Yes, I think that had a lot to do with it. And I think that... Um, I think there was a privilege that, uh, that I enjoyed um, on the north side. I wasn't exposed to threats uniquely. I was shielded from them. I was, I was exposed to hospitality. I was exposed to generosity. Um, people gave me gifts. I gave them gifts. You know, um, there were just these, you know, these, these moments that I'll, I'll never forget. You know, um, there was a time I was with the Hingstons in the book, and, I, um, and it was February. I'm born in February, and um, it was cold. They didn't have heat on. They didn't have heat on, and uh, they were living right off uh, 19th and Wright around there. And and they said, Matt, can you go down and like bang bang the furnace up so we can you know see if you can help us get the heat on. So I went down there and I kind of banged the furnace. You know, I didn't know what I was doing. I just <laughs> like I don't know. Um, but then I came back up and uh, they got me a birthday cake. You know, uh, and they sang happy birthday to me. And there are moments like that that just affirmed how gracefully and powerfully the people I met in this city, in this amazing city, uh, refused to be reduced to their hardship. They, they wouldn't let the obstacles that they were facing uh, overcome their heart. And as you describe that, um, and I know you're not a guy who likes to, to talk about yourself, um, but uh, people have asked you, uh, as you say in the book, uh, what was the experience like for yeah. you recording these stories? And you said you have some sort of uh, stories that you toss off to people if, yeah. uh, if you don't really feel like telling the, yeah. the real uh, answer. And, but the real answer in the book, you said, you found this experience heartbreaking. Yeah. And it left you depressed for years. Yeah. Why? I think, I think that's the most honest way I could say it. And it's because, you know, this level of inequality, this cold denial of basic rights, this blunting of human capacity, this is outrageous. This is unnecessary. And I think that seeing that day in, day out was heartbreaking. And I remember I uh, was on this one eviction with the sheriff crew. And uh, we went into the house. And it was just kids. It was just kids. And uh, the mom had died. And the kids just had went on living. And it was raining. And the sheriffs moved the kids and this stuff out. And they closed the door. And then it was on to the next eviction and the next one. And I think seeing that stuff affected me. I think it should have affected me, and it kind of stuck with me. But there was also these other things that stuck with me. And um, so I'll never forget this one day. Um, uh, it was with Vanetta and Crystal. And there were these um, women that had met at a homeless shelter, um, the Salvation Army homeless shelter, which uh, a lot of folks just call the lodge. So you could tell your kids, like, we're staying at the lodge tonight like it's a hotel. And, um, and they were homeless, looking for housing. And um, they were at McDonald's eating lunch. And this boy walks in. And he was like 9 or 10. Uh, his clothes were disheveled. And he didn't go up to the, um, to the counter to order. He went around to the tables. He was looking for scraps. And, uh, you know, Vanette and Crystal turned to each other. And they said, like, what you got? And they pulled their money 
and they bought him lunch, and they sent him on his way. And I think like those are the moments that buoyed me through that hard time, and those are the moments that um, that really reaffirm the fact that um, you know the poor don't want some small life. You know they don't want to eke out an existence. They don't want to game the system. They want to contribute and they want to thrive. They want to become nurses. That was Veneta's dream. They want to have their own charities. That was Arlene's dream. But poverty reduces people born for better things. And I think that, that it's, it's not something that we have to tolerate in this country, and I don't think it's something that we should tolerate in this country. So let's talk a bit about solutions, because you raise a, a few points near the end of the book about what could be done yeah. if we choose to do it. And that's an important point, I think, yeah. if we choose to do it. Uh, Let's walk through a couple of these. Housing court. Yeah. You said you'd like to see people, the tenants who are being evicted, have representation, and that so often does not happen. Right. So if you uh, get arrested for a criminal crime and you are indigent, you have a right to an attorney. We know this, right? Um, and we know this because of Gideon versus Rainwright. We're at a law school, so we could quote mm -hmm. some cases. And the Supreme Court unanimously decided you can't have a fair trial without a lawyer by your side. Not so in civil court, not so in civil court. So uh, low-income families have absolutely no right to attorney in civil court. And uh, what that means is that in some housing courts around the country, 90% of landlords have attorneys and 90% of tenants don't. And so imagine you're a tenant, you have to go to court to face your landlord's attorney. Maybe you have a high school education. Um, you've never done this before. Uh, would you go, would you even go? Most tenants don't. So 70% of tenants in Milwaukee summoned to eviction court don't even show up. And so what can we do about that? I think extending free access to public legal service in housing court would be a really important step in the right direction. It would curb frivolous evictions. It would allow tenants to have their day in court. And they could have their day. You know, They could actually go to work or they could stay home and watch their kids while their attorney makes their case. Uh, most cases aren't made today. So I think that, you know, this is something that's been, ex this is a right that's been extended around the world, not only in like cases we always quote when we say that, like Sweden and France, but also like India, Azerbaijan, Zambia, but really behind the times on this one. And so I think that this is, that would be a kind of a, a way to like have an upstream intervention to stem the, co the consequences of eviction that we pay for downstream. Uh, public housing, I think there's a, a, a common conception out there on the part of people that, well, a lot of poor people live in public housing, but it's right. not really the case, is it? It's not only not really the case, it's the opposite thing, right? It's the opposite thing. So the vast majority of low-income families have received no housing assistance whatsoever. About one in four families in this country that qualify for housing assistance receive anything. And let's just like pause on that statistic a little bit. Like, what if we turn away like three and four families that applied for food stamps, hungry? I'm sorry, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, okay. That would be outrageous to us, but that's exactly how we treat like the basic human need of housing in the country today. And in big cities like Washington, D.C., the waiting list for public housing isn't counted in years, it's counted in decades. So like, you could be like a young parent and you could apply for public housing in our nation's capital, and you could be a grandparent by the time your application is reviewed. So there's just not enough aid to meet the growing need. Yeah. So, so you lean toward expanding housing vouchers, universal yeah. housing vouchers yeah. for low-income people, period. Uh, yeah. What do you mean, what would you like to see in a perfect world, your world? Yeah, I think that getting to this, getting to like what should we do about it, means answering another fundamental question, which is, do we believe that housing is a right? Do we think that access to decent, affordable housing is part of what it means to live in this country? Uh, I think we have to say yes to that question. Because, as you mentioned before, without stable shelter, everything else falls apart. This country affords us freedom. Freedom to better ourselves, better our kids, improve our communities. But those freedoms are massively compromised if we don't have a grasp on stable shelter. And um, if that's the case, then I think that we need a way to deliver on that right. Something that's not just we need to build a little bit more public housing or invest in the National Housing Trust, but something that is on the scale of the problem. And the good news is we already have a program that works pretty well. And the other good news is we've already made massive 
like improvements in terms of housing. And I know that when we talk about these issues, it kind of feels like, uh, you know, are we, are we always going to live with this or is there anything we can do? And the answer is absolutely yes. You know, a few generations ago, we had slums, you know, ravaging our cities. You know, we had low-income families living without heat and running water. We had outhouses in the middle of Philadelphia. We've done massive jo good job of eradicating those problems from our country. And now we're facing another problem, which is unaffordability. The fact that a lot of low-income families can't afford a roof over their head. So what if we took this housing voucher program that we already have, sort of about 2 million households in this country, and what if we expanded that to, um, to all uh, families below uh, the poverty level or below a certain income level? What that would mean is people like Arlene, moms like Vanetta, uh, would not pay 70 or 80% of their income on rent. They pay about 30% and they could take that voucher and live wherever they like to in the city as long as their housing wasn't too expensive or too shoddy. It would massively change the face of poverty in the country. Evictions might become rare again, like they were several generations ago. Uh, family homelessness would plummet. You know, moms would be allowed to invest in their kids and invest in their financial security. We know that after years on the waiting list, one of the first things families do when they get their housing voucher with their freed up income, one of the first things they take that freed up income is the grocery store. They buy more food. We know that their kids become less anemic. They become stronger. But most kids that are parts of low income renting families aren't so lucky and their kids aren't eating enough to eat. We don't need to tolerate that. And so I think that there's a way of expanding that and there's a way of doing it in a way that's cost efficient and makes sense. Because those are the arguments that you hear from uh, people who are skeptical of this. They'll say, isn't there a potential disincentive here for people to try to work more because yeah. you're gonna subsidize yeah. housing? Uh, and, and then the other qu question you hear is, how can we afford this as a country? We're facing yeah. you know, an incredible debt. Yeah. Um, how do we do this? What yeah. are your answers to those questions? Yeah. So to the first question, they're both fair questions. They're questions that have to be on the table. We've actually studied uh, do housing vouchers, are they a disincentive to work? The research is kind of mixed. There's some findings that says, yes, it's a mild disincentive to work. There's some findings that say, that have null effects. But I think the bigger picture is like, you know what's the biggest disincentive to work? This massive unaffordable housing crisis we have on our hands. And so one of the findings that we found in a statistical study that we did is that eviction is actually a pretty darn good uh, cause of job loss. And anyone that's been through an eviction knows why. It's this consuming, stressful event. And it could cause you to make mistakes on your work, at your job. It could cause you to relocate further away from it. Um, it kind of takes over your life. And which is why, you know, workers in our study that experience an eviction are about 20% more likely to lose their job the following year, all else equal. So one way of like stabilizing the American workforce and incentivizing work is to offer affordable housing. You know, I think the affordable housing program is a human capital investment, it's a, it's a community investment, and it's a public health initiative all rolled into one. That would be my answer to the first question. My answer to the second question about affordability is twofold. One, I think it's important to recognize, can we just say, like, we already have a universal housing program in this country? It's just not for poor people, okay? It's for, it's for middle class and rich homeowners. So the year that Arlene was evicted, we spent, as a nation, about $171 billion on um, homeowner benefits, okay? We spent, during that same year, about $40 billion on direct assistance to the needy for housing assistance. So that number, $171 billion, that's like the entire budgets that year of the Department of Education, the Department of Veteran Affairs, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Justice combined. It's large, it's a large number. So I think that if we're gonna talk about affordability, can we afford this? I think we should at least be honest with ourselves about like the richest country on the planet can afford doing more. If poverty persists in this country, it's not for our lack of resources, we lack something else. But there's ways that we can do this that are efficient. And there's some economists that suggest that by just making the housing voucher program more efficient, work better, make it more cost effective, we could actually expand this in a great way without increasing spending. You want to have a conversation. I hear you saying you want to have a conversation about our priorities. We need to have a conversation about the fact that moms like 
Veneta, um, have to choose between paying the rent or stocking the fridge. We have to have a conversation uh, that moms like Arlene can face eviction because she calls the building inspector on her landlord. We have to have a conversation about the fact that, you know, we're not evicting uh, folks in the tens of thousands or the hundreds of thousands anymore, but probably in the millions every year. That's leaving a deep and jagged scar on the next generation. That's why housing has to be in the center of the poverty debate. It has to be at the top of our poverty agenda because without addressing housing, we're not gonna make a dent. We've got time for a few questions. Uh, uh, there are a couple of people in this room who have microphones. You can see them there. Um, if you have a question, please keep it brief and uh, talk into the microphone and uh, we'll take as many as we can. Please raise your hand Hello. if you have a question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Hi, when you talk about affordable housing, how is the low-income tax credit program increasing the number of affordable housing units uh, in the city or in cities, and are they doing anything to solve this problem? Yeah, so a lot of the, so housing poverty is vast and complicated, and there's a lot of things going on in cities. The low-income tax credit is a credit for builders or constructors that incentivizes them to set aside some affordable housing units for uh, low-income families. I think it's working. Uh, I think it's it's working. Some of the criticism to the, of that program is that it's it um, it doesn't serve the the poorest of the poor. You know, it serves folks that um, are more uh, what sociologists used to call lower middle class, or folks that just aren't the folks that make up uh, the evicted population in our cities today. I'm, I'm open to whatever's on the table. You know, I think that a universal housing program is one of many solutions, and I think that different cities have different needs. So what works in Milwaukee might not work in Atlanta or New York City or San Francisco. But let's have, let's have the conversation, and let's put the low-income tax credit on the table, too. Let's take a question over here. Yes, sir. Hi, I was wondering, um, you talked a little bit about eviction on the north side, a little bit kind of with white eviction. Can you talk about how eviction is maybe different or similar for the Latino population here in Milwaukee? Yeah, one thing that we found when we looked at the Latino population here is that they were hit extremely hard by the foreclosure crisis. And so uh, Latinos in the survey that we did um, have uh, very high rates of forced displacement when you, con when you look at landlord foreclosure, the landlords that are losing their properties and tenants have to move because of it. So on the, on the near south side of Milwaukee, they were, they were hit uh, exceptionally hard by the foreclosure crisis, which is something we also see in, in national data. Let me go back here, yes. Um, what would you expect from a law like one recently and very recently signed in this state that actually makes it easier for landlords to evict people based on allegations of behavior of the tenants or their guests? So this is a law that, uh, that this is a law that's, does, I, I guess, my understanding is designed to expand landlords' power in a way. I think that's accurate. Um, okay. I mean, I, I, I don't think that um, if there's a power imbalance, that's not the, um, <laughs> that's not how the scales are tilted. Um, and so I think that, I think that the biggest problem is the lack of affordable housing. And if, you, if you're holding on to your housing with such a loose grip, if you're moving in and not able to pay first month's rent, last month's rent security deposit, you're behind from day one and at a heightened risk of eviction. So this law, in a way, reflects maybe the status quo for low-income families more than it does exp expand power uh, in, in that way. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the ins and outs of this law. I, I, I know it kind of just, just made the newspaper a few weeks ago, but forgive me for not being uh, up, up on it. Yes. In the last five years, Wisconsin has stripped away a lot of the tenants' protections. So a lot of this is the solutions you're talking about are legislative solutions. Did you interview, did you talk to any of the Wisconsin legislators in writing your book and getting stories from them? Sure, absolutely. But I think, that, I think that if you and I looked at the tenant protections that were on the books in Milwaukee, uh, I think we'd say that's pretty good, pretty fair. 
Um, you know, if, if your landlord doesn't fix an appliance, you can withhold the rent, not only by putting it in escrow, but literally keeping it. Um, building inspectors uh, are mandatory, are, are, they, they respond in a mandatory way when you call them to report housing conditions. So I think that there are certain laws on the books now in this city uh, that seem to be working and seem to be fair. But again, if, you, if you're someone like Arlene, um, those laws really don't apply to you. Not because um, landlords can execute retaliatory evictions and those are legal, they're not, but because you can evict someone at any time for being behind in rent. And if you're a landlord, you might be swayed in that certain way if you have a tenant that's decided to be in a more adversarial relationship with you. So there are landlords in the book that, that you see going from working with a tenant to evicting her because she called the building inspector. So what I think that means is stepping back from like the legislative power of laws or stepping back from an idea of like, do tenants know their rights? I think confronting like just the base, the base fact that uh, so much of the income is going to rent allows those laws to work or not, right? Extend those laws to everyone in the city or reserves them only for people that will never have to ask their landlord's compassion. Let me take one final quick question. Uh, yes, Dr. Desmond, I just wanted to ask you um, about the word homelessness, chronic homelessness, because it's so dramatic, it's so sad. Uh, what are your comments about that? Because an eviction does lead to that situation, correct? And also how it impacts children, their education. I mean, if they don't have an address, how do you help the kids out? And it's something that school teachers face often. So uh, many times when we think about the homeless, we kind of have this picture in our head, right, about the visible homeless. And uh, often the visible homeless are uh, older men. Um, but uh, we should picture people like Arlene and her kids. That's who we should picture. You know, we, the face of the homeless um, community in the country is basically the face of moms and kids. Kids, you know, the average age of the evicted child in Milwaukee is seven. Most homes in Milwaukee that face eviction have kids living in them. And so you're absolutely right to put a focus on kids. And if you spend any time at the lodge, you know, uh, you'll see a lot of kids. You'll see a lot of kids there. And so, so what is that doing to those kids? You know, I think that if anyone's gone to an eviction, they understand how traumatic it can be and how it really assaults your sense of safety and your sense of stability. We found that moms that were evicted were depressed two years later after the event. That has a deep effect on those kids. And uh, robbing kids of kind of developing relationships with their neighbors, relationships with their teachers at schools, I think, I think the effect on kids is massive. It's something we, we need more research on. But what's unquestionable is like, this problem is, is one of the biggest problems, I think, facing low-income communities today. And we, we need to do something serious about it. I've only got about a minute and a half left here, but I wanted to ask you a, a final question. What's next for you? What, what's gonna get your attention next? This is obviously, you feel yeah. passionately about this issue. Yeah. What, what do you want? Yeah. Well, so this problem, this problem of um, a lack of adequate housing is not just a problem for Milwaukee and New York and Boston. It's a problem for London. It's a problem for cities like Delhi, uh, for cities like Lagos in Nigeria, who now have is a city of 20 million people. Um, all around the world, you know, uh, we, people have moved into the city. Uh, and the city is become un becoming unaffordable to millions, even billions, uh, all around the planet. And so understanding the rise of this thing I'm calling the unaffordable world, understanding why cities are responding to it differently, understanding the impacts that it has on the global poor, I think that's one of the biggest challenges facing us as, as a human race um, for the next 100 years, and that's, I'm, I'm going to take a stab at it. And in the meantime, yeah, that's not a small project. <laughs> I should say one of the interesting things about this event and, and tonight you're going to be at the Boswell Books, but you're still staying in touch with people you yeah. met during the project. Yeah. Is that, that, that's important to you, isn't it? It's very important to me. I mean, uh, we're friends, you know, and, um, and I've watched uh, kids grow up. And when I come back to Milwaukee, which I don't do enough, um, but I wish I did, I... You know, we visit and we catch up and we text and we call each other. And 
um, that's been a, a beautiful part of my life, and I'm very grateful for their friendship and everything that they've taught me. We are uh, very grateful for your attention, your interest uh, in today's subject. We want to mention again that the name of the book is Evicted, Poverty and Profit in the American City. Its author is Professor Matt Desmond from Harvard. We are delighted that you would uh, do your first event in, uh, behind the new book here at Marquette Law School. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.